Welcome to week three. We have a lot of material to get through, so let's just get started. Interior designers who understand how buildings stand up and the various parts of the structure can work more closely with architects, contractors, and engineers. But anytime an interior design um, or anytime interior design work affects the structure, the designer must consult with these other design professionals. So just because you understand maybe how some structure works doesn't mean that you can run off and, and deal with it on your own. The structural system supports the weight of the building by transferring the load of the structure to the earth below. Structure can be made up of wood, masonry, concrete, steel, or a mixture of materials. Now, structure is not always what it seems. Sometimes you may think the structure is brick, but the brick may simply be a veneer covering a steel skeleton or concrete wall. So this is the Wainwright building that was designed by Louis Sullivan, and you can see here, this is when they started building the structure. This is one of the earliest buildings to employ this steel frame skeleton. And because these steel beams take on the weight, the terracotta you see here on the exterior is actually just a skin or a covering. It doesn't support anything structurally. Even though these look like you know stone columns, it's actually these beams inside that are holding the weight. The superstructure of the building refers to the columns, the beams, and the load-bearing walls. So column, beam, and then this load-bearing wall here. The foundation is basically what supports the superstructure and then everything that's filled in. And the, the type of soil that is, exists on the site will affect how the foundation is built. The building load refers to any weight or force placed upon a structure, including not just the building itself, but the people, furnishings, rain, snow, wind, seismic activity, and even airplanes. Static loads, or dead loads, as you see here in this image, are basically the permanent parts of the building, so it's the structure of the building. Live loads refer to anything that will weigh the building down um, gradually, but also can change here and there. So people, furniture, um, that would also be wind, or not, sorry, not wind, rain and snow, etc. Dynamic loads refer to a sudden force of pressure that's placed on the structure, and that would be wind or seismic activity or an airplane or something, something running into the structure. Compression, deflection, and tension are ways that a building receives the load. So here you can see the weight is coming down on the building. The, the part of the, this is a beam and a post. The part of the post that is uh, bending down from its original space, this amount of area here is called deflection. And the act of this is called compression. The, the ability of this, this beam to bend and give is called tension. The most basic structural form is the post and lintel or the post and beam. Here you can see two, two methods, some of the earliest here at the Parthenon, and then here's a post and beam frame for a, a house that's being built in, in contemporary times. The, this type of framework in large buildings creates a grid structure. So inside you can see these, these beams or columns. Here's an example of a, a grid layout. So, Here's the, the columns that exist that are supporting the beams throughout the building. Here's some interior columns. And then within this grid, the designer can place any non-load-bearing interior walls that they would like to build out the space. Another type of structure is the arch. Basically what an arch does is it transfers the load from, from above to the posts on the side of the wall. Cantilevers, made famous by Frank Lloyd Wright, work because the projecting member carries the load along the length to the supporting wall by using gravity and the stress of the load, much like a diving board. Here's a very famous example of cantilever construction. 
Bearing wall construction relies on the entire wall to carry the load of the building to the ground below. Here you can see a, a, a masonry wall that supports a concrete beam. And this is one being constructed. These steel beams, this is called rebar, are inserted inside the hollow cavities of these blocks and then the inside is filled with mortar. This gives it additional strength. Now, lintels or arches are required above windows and doors that cut into a bearing wall. So here you can see a lintel. Here's one that's being installed. Essentially what these do is carry the load to either side of the wall and um, when they're made of wood instead of uh, stone, then they're called headers. And here you can see a header here. So this is a typical two by four wall frame inside, um, inside your wall, probably that you have in your house or, or um, even in, even in uh, commercial buildings, they, they'll look like this. So anytime you cut open for a window or a door here, there's got to be this header above, just a, basically a thicker beam that supports the weight above here. Shear walls are exterior bearing walls with panels, these panels here, usually plywood or something, that are installed to basically counter the force of wind or seismic activity, something that would be pushing against the side of the wall. And then sometimes they'll even place a diagonal beam in, in, um, inside the wall this way to give it some extra protection. The tube structural system that was designed in the 1960s by Fazlur Khan uh, basically employs this kind of sheer concept. And what it is, here are some plan views, and here's an exterior view. What it is is basically a braced frame that exists around the perimeter of the structure, and then they take a rigid floor panel, meaning a, a floor panel that's, that's solid and in, in, um, connected to the tubes and that helps support it. So this allowed buildings to, or skyscrapers, very tall buildings, to come in many different shapes and, and heights. Stud wall construction relies on several vertical members called studs that can be either wood or, or steel depending on the structure that carry the weight from this plate above to the sole plate below. Here you can see a real life example. And um, sometimes these walls can be bearing and sometimes they can be non-bearing. Fenestration is the technical name for windows or doors or openings in the building envelope. Windows are rated by the NFRC or the National Fenestration Rating Council and will list their U factor or the ability of the glass to reduce heat loss during non-direct exposure the solar heat gain coefficient, or the ability of the window to reduce heat gain during direct exposure, and the light transmittance or E-level on the label. Windows with a low U-factor below 0 0.40 and a low SHGC or solar heat gain coefficient are desired for sustainable construction. An architect will often prepare a door and window schedule which calls out the various types of doors and windows on the plan. It typically lists the manufacturer, the type, the model number, and also the rough opening dimensions here. The studs in, for exterior door and window openings on load-bearing walls have to be framed out with double and sometimes even triple um, studs and headers. So here you can see there's a, a double stud here. Um, or they're calling it a king stud. And so oftentimes there'll also be like a double header above just to make it a little stronger. Doors and non-load bearing walls do not necessarily require the extra framing. Now, as an interior designer, you may be asked to specify window and door type, style, frame, and hardware. And of course, each selection must take into consideration the function, style, and practicality. So you're not going to put a hollow core wood door on an exterior wall because you need the door to have insulation, um, safety features, and you know be rather um, weatherproof. 
but perhaps you use that on a closet where none of those things are an issue. Heavy timber construction is um, essentially just really large pieces of, of timber that support uh, in a post and beam fashion. And these are desirable in some commercial spaces because they're fairly fire resistant. Gypsum wallboard is the most common substrate for interior walls. It's also called drywall or sheetrock and it's made of gypsum here sandwiched in between two pieces of really heavy paper. And then once installed against the studs, it's taped with um, some sort of joint tape and then um, troweled over with a, with a treatment. A lot of times in less expensive construction, they'll spray on the, the plaster, it's not technically called plaster, but the, the finish, and then they'll trowel it, they'll knock it down. So that's how you get that, that texture on there. If you want a smooth wall, if you want to specify that in your interior, it costs a lot more money because it takes a lot more labor. It's much more difficult to achieve that effect. Now, um, there are various types of, of gypsum wallboard. There's water resistant that is used in bathrooms and places where there are plumbing and things. And then there's also type X and type X is the fire rated. So anytime you have a fire rated wall, you need to use type X gypboard. The standard sizes are four by eight and they come in either half inch thick or five eighths, five eighths inch thick. Masonry walls will require a furred out space for pipes and wires and openings must be spanned by an arch or lintel. Here you can see this is a furring and it's essentially just adding a little bit of space, a wood stud and then a gyp board will be applied here on the front so that there's room inside for the wires and piping because the wall is solid. CMU or concrete masonry units are considered to be non-combustible. Structural masonry walls require that block be at least 8 inches thick or 6 inches thick with reinforced steel bars. And those walls can be no taller than nine feet if they're considered to be structural. Now here are the different parts of a masonry wall. Um, essentially a horizontal row here is called a course. Then a whole bunch of them put together is called a field. And then the actual vertical portion is called a wide. So if there was here you can see there are two wides. On on this end part here there are only one. Whenever concrete is used in a in a floor, in a wall or um or in any sort of construction system, expansion joints and control joints must be installed. These uh, could very likely be control joints, basically where concrete's poured and then it's etched so that it doesn't crack anywhere here on the surface. An expansion joint actually has some sort of soft material placed in it, and, and this allows the concrete to expand and contract based on heat, and sun exposure, and, um, and so forth. And again, it prevents the, the concrete from cracking. In a masonry wall, anytime you have a change in surface, like if you have a level change like here, or you put a door opening, or a wall is coming in this direction, you have to use an expansion joint. Or at least every 100 to 200 feet along the same wall, there must be an expansion joint. Now natural stone can either serve as the structure of a building, or as a veneer. And common types of stone in the US, natural stone are granite. Granite's hard, strong, durable, abrasion resistant, and weathers fairly well. Also there's marble, um, which is hard, strong, durable, um, has high compressive strength, and is most durable in, in, in dry climates. Not very good for messy areas though, because it stains very easily. And limestone is softer and more porous, best used in dry climates, and actually hardens and gets a little stronger when it's exposed to weather. So that's it for the first video. I know it was really exciting. Next, 
you'll see one on horizontal structures. 